Some familiar faces, nice to see. Um, we're going to uh, probably make this a little participatory. I wasn't quite sure what the stage was going to be like. I had this vision of being able to even sit on the side of the stage, but I don't think that's going to work. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, Tom Erickson, uh, I'm a, um, how does this supposed to go? It's like, I'm a Drupalist. I've been a Drupalist for 10 years, and I haven't used WordPress or Squarespace or Joomla for that period of time. Something like that, isn't that how the confession goes? Um, but let's, let's try to have a little bit of fun here. Um, most of you, if you don't know me, um, uh, I have a, a very lofty title. Um, I've been Dries's partner at Acquia for really, uh, since Acquia got started, helped to start the company as a board member and became the CEO a little bit later. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I'm gonna use today to, to talk a little bit about um, um, some of the observations I've made um, in that time uh, as a CEO. So I've got a little bit of an agenda. Um, we're gonna vary from that and we're gonna have a few questions as well. Um, just a couple of things about me. Um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I am actually kind of a technical person. I graduated with an engineering degree and I was a programmer in 1974. We didn't call them software engineers. And the technical degree I have was actually an engineer. And back then, anybody wanted to call them an engineer who didn't have an engineering degree was looked down on because you weren't really an engineer. You know, you were something else. Um, so I certainly started my life in a very technical way. And uh, somewhere along the lines got involved in business and found out that other people were better at the technical things than I was. And so uh, I better get out of the way and let them do what they do better than me. Uh, the last 10 years have been really interesting. Uh, yeah, if you, if you don't want to hear from a non-technical guy, probably not a good place to be. Um, but um, uh, it's been a very interesting time uh, as far as Drupal cons and Drupal community. Uh, there have been times it's been very frustrating uh, certainly very times as well that it's been very humbling. Um, it's an amazing thing what the Drupal community is. It is, I, I, every time I meet someone new and I talk about Drupal, I talk about how amazing the community is that these million plus members with tens of thousands of developers get together and create something that's totally awesome. And, and I really believe that in the bottom of my heart. Uh, I've never lost my enthusiasm and my passion uh, and as I step down at Acquia as the CEO, um, I'm planning to spend uh, some more time even on the board of the company and really trying to contribute back in, in ways that I can going forward. Um, so this is the business track of Drupal, and I'm going to ask just a couple of questions about that. I'm going to deviate from what I was asked to do, which is help people understand how to build better businesses in Drupal. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit to you as opposed to um, sort of do that coaching role. I'm happy to do the coaching role and I've attended many, many business summits and uh, CXO days and other things where I've had the chance to play that role and I've enjoyed it a lot, but that's not what's gonna happen today. So um, first I wanna just start out asking a bit about you. The first thing is, are, are any of you, I assume, raise your hands, how many of you are non-technical? Okay. You only somewhat qualify, Yoha, because uh, you also have business responsibilities. So of those, raise your hands again, the, the people that had their hands raised. How many of you, everybody was non-technical, how many of you are responsible for a business? Uh, leave your hands up, like running an agency or something like that. So a good number of you. Um, how many of you are technical? Yeah? Okay, so why did you come? And you don't know, it's interesting. Why did you come in the back? Get a different perspective, right. Okay, well good, I'm glad, uh, and hopefully you'll get a different perspective here. Um, I do wanna say that I, I really do have an appreciation for everything that's, uh, that is technical. I realize the world does revolve around that. We, uh, at Acquia, about two years ago, decided we are gonna make all of our, we're gonna make a much bigger focus on marketing to developers and telling the story, because developers are, are making a lot of decisions. I think at the same time, if you take a look at a lot of businesses with the proliferation of marketing technologies, 
what we're seeing happen is that dollars are shifting from technical areas uh, in businesses uh, like um, IT departments and CIOs to marketing departments and the decision making for which tools they're going to use and how they're going to uh, deploy that is, is shifting. And there are people who believe that in the future the marketing budgets around technology will be bigger than the IT budgets for, um, for those businesses. And in some businesses like uh, consumer technologies, that might indeed be the case. And so there's a big message here that relates to, uh, to that. And I think it's uh, important that we, we get that down. So my next question, and then I'll, I'll get into some of the things, is how many of you think that Drupal is the very best CMS content management system on the market today? All right. I'm not seeing some hands here. So help me understand. What is missing? Me. Either. Yeah, you or somebody else right next to you. Sure. Yep, it is. Um, and I think uh, some organizations uh, require different things from the CMS, uh, but uh, we may be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I take, for example, uh, a client who, to be very much, would have liked to have used the Drupal content management system. Um, but for them, the requirement was uh, to have a product or CMS that their editor was already had experience with. Um, and so for them, the best product. And what was that? Uh, okay, I'll say it. Uh, yeah, I said WordPress. WordPress, great. Yeah. No, we're going to talk a lot about names today, and there won't be bad things. We're going to talk about marketing, and that won't be a bad thing. We're going to talk about WordPress. We're going to talk about Squarespace. We're going to talk about Adobe. We're going to get it all on here today. So bring it all out. Pardon me? Life Ray also. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really good point. Depends on the use case. Uh, as far as the best thing, you know, what is the best thing? And um, uh, that's, that's a really good point. Anybody else have another perspective they want to share before I get stuck in? Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. It depends on the investment that Brian wants to So it depends on the investment that deals with some of the things Dries talked about this morning. For those of you that saw the, uh, um, you know, his keynote talked about uh, ambitious websites. So Drupal, very good for that. Yes. Yes. Depends on the support of the technology as well. Yeah. Yep. All great points. So. What I want to um, uh, do, though, uh, now then, is take that and um, take these thoughts and lessons, because as we think about those questions, it depends. You then have to think about, OK, how do we best make Drupal, all right, that's called positioning in marketing context. How do you take what Drupal's strengths are, and how do you position it in the market? so that the right people know about it at the right time and you have a good chance of winning that client as opposed to position it incorrectly and trying to provide it to people who won't see the benefits of the product. And that is all about this marketing thing that we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, um, a little bit about, more about me because um, uh, it's fun to talk about yourself, but uh, just to give yourself uh, some knowledge on my technical chops, in 1981, uh, I was the first person to put a computer on an offshore platform. It was in Western Australia, and it was a very big computer, the size of this stage almost. And uh, we used it for project planning on building this billion dollar at the time. That was a lot of money. Maybe it still is a lot of money. Uh, uh, but in 1981, a billion dollars was, is a lot more money today. Um, and we used it for planning to try and save time and money on that platform. And I was the tech guy responsible for that, not the business person. Um, so when I talk about things that uh, have a technical bias, I want everybody to appreciate the fact that I talk about someone who has it in my heart and in my soul. I still build computers today. One of our clients, uh, a Drupal user, very proud, CMO of AMD, 
who introduced a new microprocessor uh, a couple of few months ago, sent me a kit that I could build my own computer again, because this is what I like to do. And um, uh, I do that. But at the same time, I have to admit, I've never committed a single line of code for Drupal. Not one. Not any niente. Zilch, zero, nada. And I thought about it, and, um, and well, I just didn't get it done. Uh, at the same time, um, what the heck have I been doing for 10 years? And, and I like to think about the fact that I wasn't a parasite just leveraging and living off of all the Drupal community efforts, that we were doing things also and contributing. So, you know, we raised a lot of money at Acquia, and we used that money to fund development, uh, to, to pay developers, to pay marketers uh, and others to do things with Drupal. And um, we've also been selling the heck out of Drupal to anybody that will listen. So uh, hundreds of thousands of miles of travel for me personally, thousands of meetings, dozens of presentations, and millions of dollars spent marketing Drupal. Just to give you some idea, we spend, for a typical analyst on any given year, almost a quarter of a million dollars to convince them that Drupal is a worthwhile solution. And just lest you think that that's an easy job to do, when we started, Gartner, who is not just a, an enterprise analyst, Gartner is also somebody that universities listen to and nonprofits. You know, they're the people who say, what's good in the CMS world? And if Drupal wasn't in appropriate place in that chart, it would, lo it would not be considered for a lot of decisions. And when we started talking to Gartner, they said, well, what's the revenue that you get from Drupal? And we told them it was zero. It's zero today. It's going to be zero tomorrow. And it'll be zero in five years. But we have a lot of clients. And these are big organizations that matter. And they said, well, I'm afraid our criteria on the vertical axis is revenue. That's the primary driver of execution. And what did we say to them? <laughs> I got very furious at a table, pounded the table. This was at DrupalCon Munich, just in case you want to know when it happened. And I said, you need to change your criteria because you guys are out of touch. The world is going open source. And all you have to do is see MuleSoft or MongoDB, who filed last week for a public offering, or uh, obviously Red Hat or other players, and you can see this is all happening. So lo and behold, eventually, Gartner changed their criteria after we canceled our subscription with them, after we did some things, and then we came back to the fold. But that takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of people who aren't developers. And so the message I have is this world uh, takes a lot of work to make the whole Drupal ecosystem work. Marketers are one, it also takes designers, it takes people that do videos, it takes people that organize conferences, and I think it's time that the Drupal community really start to accept the fact that a community has to include and embrace all of those people. It's a concept I call inclusion. <laughs> and inclusion's been an area of discussion in the Drupal community. This is something I call role inclusion. And I think the future of the Drupal community is gonna be very much based around the ability for that, for this community, for our community, to include others. And I'll, I'll walk through some of that uh, later today. But just to give you a little bit of a briefing on, um, sorry, this is, uh, I'm talking too much and not uh, showing enough, a little bit of a briefing on how well uh, some of this stuff works. Um, this is a, a, a slide that we're going to be able to share, sorry, a video, share with everybody and give back to the Drupal community. So an example of giving back. And just listen to this and then we'll see how you feel after this uh, video. Think for a moment of the brands and companies shaped by Drupal. The power brands. The makers. The institutions. the cultural icons that unite us. 
the ones that make us sing. Carry us away. The agile. The resilient. And the ones who support them. The developers. The millions across the globe. The marketers. The front line behind the glass. The road warriors. The people out in the wild fighting every day. The agencies. The masters of strategy and emotion. So what do all these people have in common? The digital platform that powers some of the most exciting experiences on the web. Drupal. So what do you guys think? It's nice, huh? <laughs> you know, it needs some work a little bit. It's not, uh, it's not perfect. Um, and uh, we have a chance to do that, but it's something that we want to be able to, to share and, and give back, and it really comes back to this idea that the Drupal ecosystem is more than code. Uh, and it's time that, you know, I think uh, we start to recognize that. And um, after 10 years here, um, the reason I titled this presentation Observations from the Peanut Gallery, I'm not sure that translates into all languages, but the peanut gallery is where the people sit that don't matter. And uh, I will admit that uh, I've sat through many of Drupal community sessions and areas, and I felt like the person that doesn't matter, uh, even though we're contributing back in, in many different ways. And uh, I think it's time that we take a look at that and say, hey, we're all in this together. And whether you're a marketer, a designer, a um, you know, technical support person, back to the point that was brought up earlier. Um, we're all building a, an amazing community that does very, very special things. You know, we need to put more value into the efforts of these designers, the facilitators, the event organizers, the volunteers, the case study and the creative agencies who create this. Um, the, the world just doesn't know about how powerful Drupal is. Dries often goes places and will ask, you know, how many of you know of Drupal? And the number still is relatively small compared to what it needs to be. And the only way we're going to get that changed, the only way we're going to get that done is by valuing what marketers do and not using it, you know, as a dirty word. Dries himself, and thank you for joining us, Dries, uh, has been bringing this issue up in different ways. Uh, he wrote about the contributions, um, and we've got this nice credit system in Drupal that talks and can walk through all the credits you give. But what about the contributions of these non-technical folks? And I really want to take this opportunity to challenge us and the community to think about how to measure those credits. One of the ideas I have here uh, today is, hey, why can't we give credits to case studies that are created and case studies that are submitted and, and announce that and say, hey, you know, Envika last uh, quarter did, or last year did, 30 case studies on Drupal, including Arsenal. Wouldn't that be cool? And, uh, and that gives credit to Invika in certain ways. And, and likewise, and on and on. And there's other ways to give credit. I'll, I'll give you another example. Do any of you remember the name of the person who built Views originally? Earl Miles. Almost everybody knows that. Do any of you remember the name of the individual who redesigned it in 2000? for, sorry, for Drupal 7 and made it substantially easier and made it so it could actually be used in a big way by a larger number of people. No, that designer was Kevin O'Leary working with Dries. He did a fantastic job, completely took, worked with Earl, but completely took it and redesigned it so that it was much easier to use. And that's the kind of celebration that I think we have to have in, in this world. Um, so I've asked Reese about why the credit system is only for code contributors and the answer you heard this morning, but I'm challenging that statement and I'm, 
I really want the team to start to go out and say, how can we measure things that are not code contributions? How can we embrace those folks? How can we bring them into the fold? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, I may be getting a little bit extreme in my remarks here, but I'm, you know, hopefully you get the point of what I'm trying to make. And the video showed us that the promotional efforts of marketers are really important, and we've had a chance to introduce people to Drupal that otherwise would, would not be there. I know marketing is a, word, a dirty word to most developers, and we've established that very few people here in this room are developers. So what's not happening today is that word's not getting out to them. It's a little bit like the debate I have with diversity in tech in general. And I started a group at Acquia called Women at Acquia. And then the group proceeded to then decide that they would only have the discussions amongst themselves, and they never wanted to share any of their conclusions or any of their observations or any recommendations with the rest of the organization. And my question to them was, how do you improve if you don't share, if you don't communicate, if you don't you know, at least make requests and demands and ask for change? And that's that same kind of of effort that needs to happen here in the Drupal community where people need to say, yeah, hey, at DrupalCon, I want to see marketers here. I want them to be part of it. I want to see more designers. I want to celebrate what they do. How do you get that diversity into this community? Hey, marketing can be ugly thing. I, I did a, uh, years ago, I did a sales training, marketing and sales, with a tech guy and he got up and he was doing the role play and we were doing role play. One point you, you role played the buyer and one point you role played the seller. And he got up when he was role playing in the seller and boy, he just, he started hammering the other individual and saying, hey, you got to get this. It's the best thing around. It's not like anything else. And I said, whoa, Andreas, hold on. He was English, of obviously from German descent. And, uh, and I said, Andreas, what? What makes you think that that's what a salesperson is? And he said, well, last weekend I went to, you know, I forget the name of the high street store that sells appliances in the UK. He said, and that's what the sales guy was like? And I said, ah, of course. That's what you think a salesperson is like. And salespeople can be pushy, you know. And the word spam, you know, was invented, you know, in 1993, let's say, and it wasn't invented by a marketer for sure. <laughs> so there are lots of things that aren't nice about sales and lots of things that aren't nice about marketing, but we need promotion and we have to embrace them, not just as potential users, but also as our brethren. And uh, I do want to say that part of this has certainly been recognized by the Drupal community, and you'll see some names up here, and I'm sorry, I haven't got Miriam up here, uh, but a big part of that as well. Um, you know, and I purposely did not include, um, and the, you'll understand why in a second, I did not include the great Drupal agencies that are around that are doing this as well. So agencies have definitely been a really big part of promoting Drupal along the way. Um, but note that none of these agencies are sponsors, and I'm not sure any of these people are here today at DrupalCon. And we have to ask ourselves, why not? Yet they are out there selling and marketing Drupal. So they're not full members of the community, and there's reasons why they don't feel like they need to be. And part of it is, and I would propose this, is that they don't see the people at a DrupalCon that they expect to be here and need to be here in order for them to say, yeah, I'm going to step up and be a better member of the Drupal community. And that's another call to arms to say, why do we have to think about how we can change and what we need to do to be more inclusive I will add that even though these success stories are there, they're not at scale. For every Drupal recommendation that's made today, I estimate there's another five that are made for a competitor. So there's got to be work that we have to do. Um, it's not easy work, but it's work that has to be done through spending money. And I hate to say this, but it's not something normal that a normal agency who works off of the kind of cash flow that an agency works off of can spend large sums of money to do. And this is perhaps the most controversial thing I'll say in my talk today, is um, so while agencies can't afford to do it, there are other companies that do have products, and I'm gonna use words and names and you know, 
If you're from these companies, feel free to stand up and say, I disagree. I love a debate, as Dries knows. And, uh, but, you know, if you take a look at what our brethren from Pantheon do, they say, they'll tell you, if you haven't decided on Drupal, don't talk to us. When you decide, come and talk to us. And oh, by the way, if you use WordPress as well, that's okay too. If we're gonna be a Drupal community, we've got to find a way to put money behind the efforts. And it can't just be Acquia. Or if it is just Acquia, we need the community to stand up and say, hey, you know, we're gonna trust Acquia on some of this stuff in a way that the community doesn't trust Acquia today. So that is one of my most important observations uh, in my time at Acquia. It feels crappy, to be honest with you, to feel like we're spending all this money and we're alone in this and then not getting any respect in the words of the great Rodney Dangerfield, if any of you remember him, did a great movie called Back to School. Anybody remember that? Happened to be filmed at my alma mater, University of Wisconsin, so I can really identify with Rodney Dangerfield and not getting respect. So, And now we're being threatened by some new fast-growing systems. Dries put up today a slide that said the headless systems are growing at 500% a year. 500% a year. These organizations are spending money to do marketing because they own their technology. So Drupal is competing against organizations, proprietary organizations, spending money because they get the revenue from them. And I would encourage the community to think about new ways to collaborate and cooperate for the benefit of everybody, which still allows more Drupal marketing to happen. And I've been picking on marketers a lot, and I've been talking about it. You know, we have a lot of competitors, Adobe, Sitecore at the high end, WordPress, Wix, Weebly at the low end. And these are the companies spending millions. And they're not immune either. WordPress is definitely being attacked, if you haven't noticed, by uh, Medium, by Squarespace, and they're feeling the effects of what's happening to them uh, on their core platforms. So open source in general has some challenges to maintain a business model, to be honest with you. At the same time, I have this theory that I believe in, which is that the Drupal community is aging. And the great contributors who were in their 20s and had lots of time and free time as they started their agencies now are in their 30s or 40s and have families with kids and mortgages and stuff that cause them to do other things in their spare time other than contribute to Drupal. And this is another big challenge that has to be addressed. Now, some of that can be done through changing technology and getting new and exciting technologies like Dries talked about earlier today into Drupal, you know, including JavaScript in ways that JavaScript can be included, you know, and continuing to add those things that the 20-somethings want to work on and improving Drupal in that way. But part of it also is about making Drupal cool. And quite frankly, when I talk to customers out in the market, many of them still think of Drupal as Drupal 5, prospects, I mean. And that also has to change. Drupal has had a policy of breaking APIs to stay relevant and to stay current. So the philosophy of staying up to speed is there. But unfortunately, the market isn't necessarily following that philosophy and not getting the message. So there's lots of work to do. Now we have an opportunity. Headless Drupal is, in my opinion, the ultimate developer's product. And it really is. And Drupal has shown that we can dominate the space when developers are there. But what can we do about these other people we have to care about? What about content authors? They need something as easy as WordPress or Squarespace. We also need to know, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Drupal excels on the back end, we know that. But living in the UI day in and day out is a world of users, a world of users that we consistently lose to is Acquia. One of the things we've had to do at Acquia, probably about four or five years ago, the first two, three years of our, four years of our life, we were able to go into the Drupal community and say, hey, we've got something better than Rackspace, let's say, and, and come and talk to us about how we can make your life easier by scaling in ways that you couldn't scale before. That's another story, and I can talk about that. 
But the last four or five years, we've had to spend a lot of money selling Drupal. We actually go through two sales cycles at Acquia. The first sales cycle is selling the client on Drupal, and then we have to sell them on Acquia. And believe it or not, it happens a lot of times we sell someone on Drupal and we never sign them up as a customer. That's not good business, all of you know that. But that does happen, and that's a challenge we as Acquia have to face and have to fix. But at the same time, it's important to understand we, we understand what it means to sell Drupal, and we lose to Sitecore more often than I care to simply because the content author somewhere said, it's too hard, it's too ugly, I can't do this. And that has to change, and the Drupal community has to help with that change. So we have to think not only about marketing, but marketers as a client, as a customer. Dries talked about this a little bit today in terms of some of the modules, like the media module, getting more tools for, for marketers that they expect. We can't continue to lose business to these players unless we make Drupal easier to use. So it's really time for the Drupal community to understand and embrace marketers from both sides of the equation, as brethren in the community and as potential customers. It's time for Drupal to become inclusive. Now, I changed the word a little bit. I've been going on and on about marketers, but they're not the only key stakeholders for Drupal. And I use this term practitioners to talk about it. And Drupal's really big competitive advantage in the market is that it can work in lots of different applications. And this is something most people don't understand. It doesn't have to just work for dot coms and marketing things. It works well for commerce. It works well for service applications. And if you are a unique, you know, if you're a brand person like Hermes has started to launch their sites on Drupal, and you want to have a great brand like Hermes and a story to be told, and you don't want to be stole by, told by Amazon or somebody else where you're just commoditized, you can use Drupal and you will love it. I'm sure of that. But who makes that decision? That's a marketer, right? But if you're also a person at Cisco Systems and you're building a new service portal for your customers to come in and rather than call up and use a help desk, you're going to introduce them to a digital experience. You're going to build that community and you do build it on Drupal. We're not talking to a marketer. We're talking to a service line leader. That's a practitioner, someone else. But it's a business person, not the IT group. And so when we talk about marketers, we probably should be talking about practitioners. Because Drupal has unique ability to address not only marketers, but everybody else. And Gartner will tell you that Adobe's biggest, biggest criticism and biggest hole is that it only thinks about marketers. And so we have to also think beyond marketers. I'm going to just give you a little bit of a, a rant, rant. I'm just checking on my time here. A little bit of a rant before I start to uh, wind up and leave some time for questions. Uh, back in 2010, I went to various members of um, the Drupal Association board. Dries was one of them. And I said, hey, we've got to find a way to include these practitioners in DrupalCon. And um, we got an enthusiastic, yes, we do. And uh, Jacob, you might remember this. So, and then we got an answer, which was, but we know how to do it better. <laughs> and we said, OK, let's give that a shot. And uh, there were business days that were created. There were business, different kinds of business tracks that were created. And here we are some seven years later, almost, or more then. And I would say, we haven't really gotten very far. All you have to do is look around the room. Or ask yourselves, how many practitioners do you see at DrupalCon? And DrupalCon Europe is a really good example of that because there are very few here. There are more in DrupalCon North America for some reason. And I will say that one of the reasons, I believe, is that we at Acquia give quotas to our salespeople to try and get people here. And uh, this year is a little bit different because the timing of DrupalCon this year is also the time of the end of our quarter and our salespeople have to be hitting their quotas and their targets. It's just the nature of the game. So it's another little pet peeve is that it's hard for us to get our clients here because we need to have our salespeople here, and our salespeople can't be here this week. So it's a kind of a catch-22. So that's a little bit of a rant about the timing of things like DrupalCon that we need to start thinking about, at least from an Acquia perspective. I know not everybody has that same uh, criteria. But back to this notion of having more involvement by practitioners, seven years later, we really haven't 
been successful at that. And here we are at a position where DrupalCon Europe is fading. And right now, you heard today, you know, there is no plan for DrupalCon Europe going forward. There is no plan because it's financially not viable. Mm -hmm. There weren't enough sponsors. We weren't able to get those sponsors. And back to the point I made earlier, the sponsors aren't here because the right people aren't here for the sponsors to talk to. And if we want DrupalCon to succeed in Europe, and I would put forward even in North America, we have to think about this differently as a community to make something happen. So what can we do? For starters, let's start being inclusive. <laughs> you know, Maybe that's not the right way we want to describe it. I like to use it just because it's a little provocative. But role inclusivity and thinking about how do we embrace the other people that matter. I know that's hard for developers. So this group and the group of our peers have to really lead that charge. We have to help our developers understand why that's important and that maybe sharing a conference with them isn't such a bad thing. Hey, we do this with our Acquia Engage. We created it four years ago because we, we did finally give up that we'd be able to do something in conjunction with the Drupal Association. And we have technical tracks at Engage. And yes, we talk a lot about Acquia, but the primary thing we talk about, back to what I talked about earlier, is Drupal. Remember, Acquia without Drupal doesn't exist. And so we have to talk about how great Drupal is. It's the core of what we are. And I'm not saying, you know, do exactly what we do, but let's have a conversation about what can be done. And there are some easy things. Back to my proposal earlier, let's start finding better ways to get case studies done and find a place to put them because, quite frankly, Drupal.org is an embarrassment if you're not a developer. If I'm a marketer and I go to Drupal.org, I think, I'm not going to use this product. Look at how ugly it is. And we've got to do something about that. Acquia spent some money to try and build Drupal.com, but even we don't have enough money to do everything we want to do, and we haven't got it quite as far as long as we wanted to. In fact, in, as a consequence, we've still been running our own Acquia.com on Drupal 6 because we spent the money on Drupal.com. Now, we're in the process of changing over to get Acquia.com on Drupal 8, but it just gives you some idea. Um, there has to be a different approach here if we want marketers to really be excited by what Drupal does. And include your customers. Find a way. Bring your customers together. Let's really get customers to be a, a celebration of what happens in the Drupal community as opposed to developers celebrating what other developers do. Those two things can coexist. Look at the other great conferences of the world. You know, Amazon's reInvent celebrates both customers and developers. It's an amazing event that grew from 19,000 people in 2015 to 32,000 people in 2016. Salesforce's event embraces both developers and marketers and practitioners. This is one of the only conferences I know. MuleSoft, MongoDB, Red Hat, all of those conferences in the open source world embrace both of those folks. Now, they went through some pain. I've talked to the folks at Red Hat about their transition because that was not always the case. But they've never looked back since that day. And that kind of change has to happen here as well. And last, as kind of a humorous note, or maybe not so humorous, more of a sad note, but this is a true story. We at Acquia also created these business summits a few years ago, and we found that we couldn't quite scale them, so we didn't continue to do them. But I was at a business summit in California, and we invited our partners to come in, and we invited them to be on panels. And we had a particular agency in uh, the Bay Area uh, founded by um, three folks. And one of those folks, a technical folk, was invited to be on a panel about finding talent, you know, which is one of the big challenges. Um, I spoke to some folks from Japan earlier today, said, we think Japan is a great market for Drupal, but we can't find any Drupal developers. So we don't know where to start. And I've spoken with lots of customers through the years uh, Figaro in France, for example, a couple of years ago, I was speaking to them. They said, we love Drupal, but we're not going to expand its usage inside of the Figaro because we cannot find developers. But I can't find some French developers. Tant mieux, huh? <laughs> uh, that's good. So, I mean, the situation has changed a little bit, but not enough that uh, we can do things. 
So this was an important track at this business summit, finding talent. And this leader of the Drupal community got up in front of business people and said, well, you know, if you're gonna hire someone to do Drupal, you know, they don't wanna come into work before 11, and uh, then they're gonna wanna do what they wanna work on, and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll probably stay late, but, um, and, you know, you don't, you have to pay them a lot, but you can just give them a lot of pizza and beer as well. And that was literally what was said, and if I was a person sitting in the audience as a marketer, or someone trying to decide, do I want to use Drupal? That was definitely not the right way to build confidence in the market. And as agencies, we've got to be really professional when we speak to these other folks and, uh, and figure that out. And we need to build confidence. You know, the value of Drupal is the breadth of our community and the diversity of the ecosystem. Future customers want assurances that they can find talent and the knowledge that they can find the teams to succeed with Drupal. They need assurances that Drupal is a solid, viable, and tested platform and secure. A lot of them are overcoming some past prejudices against open source and may still be working under the assumption that open source software is less secure than proprietary alternatives. So confidence is imperative. They often think that open source is disorganized and lacks governance, that open source is somehow less trustworthy than something they have to pay for. And these really are the challenges that we have. And so as I, I wrap up, I just want to thank you all for the last 10 years. It's been awesome. And I know that uh, Joe Wikes warned people yesterday, I might cry, I'm getting close to that now, Joe, as I think about this. There's been a lot of discussion around Dries' blog post about who contributes to Drupal and how to fix the system. We need to really elevate that discussion and accelerate it because we, you know, we're looking at DrupalCon Europe not happening. It can happen, it can be financed. There are ways to do this and continue this amazing show that we have, this amazing conference, this amazing collaboration, this amazing way of getting people together. I personally don't believe a network of Drupal camps will solve that, will work the same. It doesn't. It doesn't bring together the diversity that we need from just geographies, much less thoughts. And, and that is the beauty of Drupal. You know, ultimately, it's about building a culture of inclusivity. And I will emphasize inclusivity, obviously, around all the ways we talk about inclusivity here. And I want to introduce the notion that we need to celebrate passion for Drupal, whether or not they can code. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. I wanted to leave some a debate, if we want to have it. it, can be on this topic. It can be, I know I promised in, the, uh, in my um, synopsis in the abstract that I would share some of the lessons learned at Acquia. I did some of that yesterday in our partner uh, conference, but I'm happy to, you know, if you have particular questions there about what it means to work with Dries for 10 years, I can tell you that, um, and why his hair is actually still standing up 10 years later. Uh, just kidding, um, but uh, or you know uh, other things. So I don't know if folks have questions or comments. Want to debate something I said? I'm happy to uh, to take that up. Yeah, Rena. Yeah, how can marketers become more involved and organically find a place? I think, you know, part of the inclusion does need to start with the developers because of the way that we run DrupalCons today and sessions are voted in, um, it's really a developer-led criteria. So I think one of the things that has to happen is, uh, as I proposed in 2010, we need practitioners to have an ability to also decide what they want to hear. And, uh, and, and curate. And sometimes that means that um, you, it's tough sometimes to get practitioners to volunteer. So sometimes you need to have professionals who are gonna decide what's right or wrong. And that doesn't fit consistently with the Drupal community model, but sometimes it's the only way because they're paid professionals and they may not volunteer their time to do the same thing that these great volunteers we have in this community do. Um, 
at least that's one of the steps. Um, you know, one of the things that marketers can do, boy, I have to think about this, because as a person been pushing that button, I've been trying everything I know, and I'm not really technically even a marketer. Um, I don't know if others have ideas about things marketers can do. Send developers to conferences. Yeah, what kinds of conferences? Yeah. But how does that make marketers, uh, you know, more, um, you know, present? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But I've, we've had marketers come, I'll just say, and they'll come and if you ask them their opinion when they leave, it's like, this is developers conference. I'm just throwing that out. Yeah. Cool. Stella, you want? <laughs> Might be off, yeah. It's a catch twenty two, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll unplug so you don't get all my photos coming up, but um, I haven't heard of it, no. Um, I've been involved in other efforts to do marketing, and I've, I've sat on committees to do that, both at DrupalCons and, and other calls. Um, it was unsuccessful, um, but I, I personally don't know anything about the Global Marketing Alliance. I don't know, Rena, if you've heard of it. Uh, so that might be a marketing problem. I'm just, that's a bit of a joke, sorry. I, I'm, I'm being very pointed, that's my style. So, but, um, you, know, you know, we are very eager to participate as Acquia in whatever ways we can do to get more marketing for Drupal. There's no question about it. I mean, just as an example, we, we had, we, so we started a site years ago. I forget what we called it now, but it was basically a reference of all the sites in the world that use Drupal. And we built it in Drupal Gardens. And when we sunset at Drupal Gardens, we, we moved that uh, content over to Drupal.com. And uh, all of that content is our case studies. Anybody can submit a case study. It doesn't have to be even a partner of ours uh, and say, you know, here's something that we can do. And uh, that's, that exists today. Um, we also, for our partners, for a long time, we've tried to create content that could be customized you know, around selling Drupal and what it means to sell Drupal. Um, but I'm not familiar with the Global Marketing Alliance, and we'd love to participate and contribute to that, so, yeah. Other, Jeff? Yeah, so Tom, so one of the things I think that has happened in the last couple of years is the, you know, certainly um, the smaller shops and the traditional Drupal shops got to a level where we were starting to Part of it was getting those big customers in. So when we talk about 